Okay, Rhodophora, our new group. The red algae. Amazing organisms, amazingly complex life cycles, but not yet the most complex we're gonna see. We're gonna spend a good deal of time getting you used to these life cycles so that you can understand them well. Phyto, of course, is plant. Roto is red or dusky. No, dusky is red. So the red algae. We now have our first group that although they contain chlorophyll, they do not contain chlorophyll A and B. They contain chlorophyll A only. So no chlorophyll B in these kinds. So there's different varieties of chlorophyll. These are chlorophyll A and B. They are red because they have an accessory pigment that also absorbs light and passes that light onto the chlorophyll. Those accessory pigments are called phycobilins. Remember, phyc means seaweed, and bilis means anger. So these are the mad seaweeds, the angry seaweeds, from their red color. If the organism is red, it's reflecting red light, and it's absorbing the other red light, so it's absorbing the green and the blue light. If you know anything about green and blue light, you should know that it penetrates the water to the greatest depth. The short wavelengths, it penetrates the depth, and that's why when you swim underwater, it starts to look greenish or bluish, right? Because those are the lights that are penetrating. So the red algae are especially well adapted for growing at great depths, and they're the algae that grow at the greatest depths. Not all of them, but there are members of the reds that grow huge, hugely deep in the things. We've got a, a picture of one that grows around 260 meters, which is very deep in the ocean. We get into almost no light at that place. Some of the reds deposit calcium carbonate. I forgot to mention this about chara. Uh, chara is also called the brittle wart, and chara also secretes <laughs> calcium carbonate on its surface a, li a little bit. Not as much as the red algae. The red algae, some of them, not all of them, some of them are very important in reef building. You know, usually it's the corals that do reef building, but there's a few algae that contribute to reef building and the red algae are, some of the red algae are important reef building algae. There, are cell, there is cellulose in the cell walls, but in addition to cellulose, there are two other compounds, agar and carrageenan. Agar or agar comes from red algae initially. It was initially discovered from the red algae. Carrageenan you haven't heard of, but it is uh, very important. It's an extremely important fruit, food stuff. I once met a salesman on a plane years ago. I sat next to him on a flight and his whole business was selling carrageenan to manufacturers, to food manufacturers. So it's a multi-million dollar business. So you just now have to start going to look at your ice cream to see if you've got carrageenan in it. Now the higher, the high class ice cream, Ben and Jerry's do not have it. But kind of the low class grocery store kinds of ice cream, go and pull those out of the grocery store case and stand there in the middle of the aisle and read the instruction, read them on the, you don't want to buy it, you don't want to eat that stuff. But so read the thing and you'll find there's carrageenan listed there. Carrageenan is an emulsifier. It's a very important emulsifier. Do you know what an emulsifier is? An emulsifier makes fat soluble. Well, of course, fat can't be soluble, so it can't really make it soluble, but it emulsifies it. The little, it makes the fat, breaks the fat up into little tiny drops and allows you to mix the fat with liquids, water like that. So it's a way of keeping fats, like fats from cream, into solution with milk, with the other liquid parts of milk or water when you're making things like ice cream and other things. So all the soft serves, they got all kinds of carrageenan in those. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a natural product. It's there, it doesn't hurt you. But um, it's a neat thing to know about the red algae, that it comes from the red algae. So they're very important economically in that way. And I'll show you a picture in a minute of the most, of the one red algae that produces the most carrageenan. It's harvested from carrageenan. Another difference now between chlorophyta and red algae is, is the site of starch deposition. Here it's outside the chloroplasts. 
red, green algae, higher plants, it's always inside the chloroplast. You've always learned it has to be inside the chloroplast. You haven't even probably paid attention to it because there's no variability. There is variability. The red algae do not produce starch inside the chloroplast. And in general, they don't have a prenoid. We're gonna see an ex uh, a contrary example of that in a second, but in general, especially the more complex ones, do not contain prenoids. So that whole thing about in the green algae, we said the prenoid has gotta be the site of the starch production, not in the red algae, doesn't. In general, no prenoids and starch production is outside the chloroplast. A different kind of starch. We're not gonna go into any detail about the chemical structure of these things, but if you remember from organic chemistry, glucose can connect in all kinds of different ways with each other. It can connect to form normal starch, it can connect to form cellulose, it can connect in different residues to form different kinds of starch. And Floridian starch is a short polymer of glucose. It's not a long starch that we eat, it's a long, very long polymer of glucose. This is a short polymer of glucose called Floridian starch, unique to the red algae. These are marine organisms. They tend to be tropical, tend to be warmer waters, tend not to be the cold water ones. The brown algae are gonna be pretty cold water. These are tend to be red, tend to be tropical, and they can be found at extreme depths. Not all of them, but there are ones that are at extreme depths. About 4,000 species give a rough idea of this, so it's a very diverse group. We're gonna just do very small examples of it, very few examples of this very diverse group of algae. So there are specialists, scientists who are specialized, there are scientists who specialize in algae, phycologists, and other phycologists that are specialists in red algae, who spend their whole career studying just red algae. There are that many of them, they're that important. Very important to understanding their life cycle. There are no flagella in these life cycles anywhere. So they're completely, we would say, azoosporic. The whole life cycle is. That means no sperm with flagella, flagella. But there are things that are like sperm. We're gonna give them a different name. It's the fault of those guys who spend their whole lives studying these things. You spend your whole life studying something, everything's gotta have a special name. Otherwise, how would we know your work was important? So we have a special name for the sperm in these cases, then they have no fl flagellated cells, no flagella on them. And the fa fantastically complex and interesting life cycles we're gonna see are probably an ad adaptation to the fact that we do not have flagellated sperm. We have sperm under a different name, but no flagella. There's also in the advanced reds, what we call pit connections between the walls and I'm just gonna to have to let you wait for a minute to see what those are like. But in general, what we've got in the red algae, at least in the more, most advanced ones, the most complex ones, is holes in the cell wall. It's a little more complex than that, but there are essentially holes in the cell wall where there's cytoplasmic continuity between the cells. Here's some of the um, forms, the growth forms we'd find in the red algae. So like in the green algae, we can have flat sheets. And now we can have another kind of filament that we're gonna just for the moment call complex branch filaments. Okay, so there's very complex branching in, the, in some of these filaments and we'll elaborate on that probably next lecture and tell you a little more about what that means, complex branch filaments. But it's a very common growth form in these algae. We also have some of the algae, which are the reef building algae, which are the coralline algae. This is the genus Coralina. Um, and they secrete calcium carbonate or accumulate. Accumulate calcium carbonate. So these segments here look like little um, lobster claws or something like that. These are the small segments of the organism, but they are not the filaments. If we were to break this all open, we would see that there are complex filaments in here with all kinds of branching and 
surrounded by calcium carbonate. And then they develop those little segments. So this is one of the important reef building algae. Irish moss. This is Irish moss. And this is the organism where we get carrageenan. So this is an important source of carrageenan, the genus Chondrus. What's this? Alva. How cool is that? You know a algae, just like you were diving. There it is. Alva and iris moss. Both flat sheets of cells. The iris moss a little more branched than alva, but still basically a flat sheet of cells. <coughs> there are very few unicellular red algae, but there's a couple of them. And so we've got a picture of one of those here to show you a few features of the cellular structure. Now, it turns out that this red algae, porphyridium, it doesn't have a typical cellular structure for red algae. In, it doesn't have to have typical cellular structure in that it has a prenoid. And most of them do not have prenoids. So that's unusual. You just have to put that aside. Everything else is, is okay. The main thing we want to see here is let's look at the chloroplast. And look at the chloroplast membrane, which runs like this. And we can see that here's the starch outside of the chloroplast, formed outside the chloroplast. So it's still associated with the chloroplast. The chloroplast is functioning in starch production, but it's not inside the chloroplast. And here's the nucleus over here. Porphyridium has been one of the most extensively studied red algae. It's a, I'd say it's a model organism in the red algae, probably because it's unicellular. Here we have some three-dimensional pictures of chloroplasts. And this is another unicellular red algae, um, Plantalia. I don't know how you describe those chloroplasts, but they're very densely branched. Around. And you can see here in the, three, in the um, focusing through it, this very branched nature of the chloroplast here. Again, I, we don't have words to describe that easily, but it's kind of nice to look at this variation in chloroplast structure. We said there are flat sheets of cells. This one's got a little holes in it, rhodomenia, and we'll see this or a relative of this in lab. We never have very much of the organism, but again, it's like um, all the, except that it belongs to a different division and will have slightly different cell structures, et cetera, characteristic of the rhodophyta. This is not a great picture in that it's not very informative, but it's from your textbooks. And this is one of the organisms that occurs at 260 meters. Very deep in the ocean, getting down to the levels where light is not penetrating anymore. And pit connections. Just return to pit connections. Okay, so we've said that there are holes in the cell walls, but it's more complex than that. So there are holes in these cell walls of these complex red algae. So there's cytoplasmic continuity then between the cells, and that's actually important in their reproduction in some cases. But at other, later in their life cycles, these holes get plugged with these plugs. And so let's look at the plugs and look at where the cells are here. So what we have in this, these diagrams is on the upper part, we have a cell. And down here, we have another cell. That's the same over in this diagram. This is just a diagram of the same thing. Then we have the cell wall. That's here and here. 
and same thing over here. This is the cytoplasm here and in this colorless place. And so that kind of or gives you an orientation of what we're looking at here. So these holes are relatively large in the cell wall. These aren't like plasma desmida, which you can barely see even under the electron microscope. Those plasma desmida give us cytoplasmic con continuity in the higher plants. They don't occur in animals. Perhaps you haven't heard about them yet, but there are in the higher plants these little tiny holes in the cell wall that give cytoplasmic continuity. These are also holes in the cell wall, but they're big, so things could move through them. Nuclei could actually move through them when they're open. But they get plugged with these pit connections. And the center of these pit connections is protein. And the outer layer, not just the inner or outer layer, I'm just going to do this whole thing here, is polysaccharide. So they then block the holes in the cell. We're going to see something like this when we get to the fungi. Certain fungi are also going to have holes in their cell walls that would allow nuclei to migrate through them. And that had suggested some people, that uh, um, allowed some people to suggest that the red algae were closely related to the fungi, an idea which is almost certainly completely wrong. It's not su supported at all by molecular evidence. Where do the red, red algae come? Well, not near the fungi, they come over here near the green plants. So by the green plants, the viridophytes, viridophyte is not an official name, but the green plants would be the green algae and all the land plants, the things that we've been talking about now. So we've jumped out of that monophyletic group, the green algae and land plants here, and gone over to their sister group, their next closest related group, the red algae. Life cycles. The life cycle of the red algae is very complex. So let's approach it in the stages by first remembering the structure of a dibionic life cycle. And then we'll start to make that a little more complex in this diagram and the next diagram and get you to the red algae. So I've already prepared the part of this diagram here to show you meiosis, syngamy, and the sporophyte. And syngamy, of course, is going to produce the zygote. And the zygote, in most cases, is going to grow into the sporophyte. The sporophyte is going to produce a sporangium. And that's the place where meiosis is going to occur. In the red algae, we are going to have two gametophytes. I'm going to draw those in next. And we're going to call them now male and female because the sex organs are going to be differentiated enough that we can use those terms um, appropriately. There's going to be something like an egg and something like sperm. They're going to be a little different, but something like it. So we can call them male and female. And just try to get in the habit of drawing the females always on the top of my diagrams. Meiosis is going to produce then the myospores, which are going to give rise to those gametophytes. So although I've been referring to the red algae, this is just typical dibionic stuff, right? We've just called the gametophytes male and female here instead of plus and minus. We're going to introduce a new term now with the gametes. And in addition to the gametes, we have now structures in, that bear the gametes. Now we've been doing this already. 
been talking about the oogonium and the antheridium. The general term for those kinds of structures like oogonium and antheridium is a gametangium. Gamete, marriage, angium box. You know the roots, so it just means the marriage box, right? It doesn't, gametangium doesn't say whether it's male or female, anything like that. It just says this is a container, a structure in the organism that is going to produce the gametes. We have skipped this up till now. And so that is where we find the gametes. For right now, I'm just going to call them gamete and gamete that fuse in syngamy. Okay, so the gametangium we've added into our life cycle. That should all have been very easy. I hope you've been practicing. Now, what's different about the red algae? I'm going to get a nice color. There's a nice rose color for red algae. The red algae have a second sporophyte between the zygote and the what we've been calling the sporophyte. So there is going to be a second sporophyte here. So in addition to a bunch of new terms, this is the major conceptual difference we have. There is going to be a second sporophyte. That sporophyte is going to produce some spores, which are going to grow into this main sporophyte, which is going to have a sporangium, which is going to produce some spores, which is going to, those are going to be the myospores, and those are going to produce the metaphytes. So it goes zygote, sporophyte, spores, sporophyte 2, spores, gametophyte. Two sets of spores, two sets of sporophytes. This second sporophyte also is epiphytic. So the second sporophyte is epiphytic on the gametophyte. Leave myself room enough to write here. So in other words, the zygote is going to be formed on the gametophyte, where fertilization takes place, and right there it's going to start growing. It's going to grow into a little sporophyte that stays attached to the gametophyte. And then it's going to shed some spores, and it's going to, those spores are going to grow into the main sporophyte. That's a question. Does it stay attached to the male or the female? It stays attached to the female gametophyte. I've just drawn it up there to show the gametophyte, and I was trying not to cross areas, but it stays attached to the female gametophyte. That's more correct, because that's where <clears throat> fertilization takes place. And we could actually call it fertilization into these cases. So let's draw that out in a little more detail for the red life cycle. And then what the last thing we'll do is we'll start adding the terms for it, because you know what this means. Yep, there's a term for that. There's a term for all of that. I'm going to use a couple different colors here. Haploid above, diploid below, meiosis. Now, in this case, we are actually going to get Fertilization, so we can, there's going to be a differentiated female and male gametes, so we can call this fertilization over here. And that is going to produce our zygote. Let's go um, around the haploid portion now, because we're going to change colors on the bottom. Meiosis gives rise to myospores. We're going to have special names for these myospores in this case. Just think of those poor phycologists labeling away for their whole lives on red algae. This is their one case chance to get some attention, make up a new term, 
torture a few students. Female gametophyte on the top. Male gametophyte on the bottom. Let's name the female egg organism here and the male organisms here. The female naturally is more complex, the, but only one term. The male is simpler, but two terms. Female, the carpogonium, and the carpogonium is what's going to unite on the, with the male side there. So it's kind of the gamete, the gamete and the gametangium is one structure on the female side. The male side, we're not going to call it the antheridium because the antheridium means that there are sperm in there or something like flagellated sperm and there aren't. We're going to call it the spermagonium. and out of the spermagonium are going to come spermatia. And why are we calling them spermatia? Because they are non-mobile. Spermagonium, spermatia on the male side. So that's really just terminology. Nothing really new there. We're going to learn some shapes of those things, which is going to be a little new, especially on the female side but nothing really strangely new there. What happens down here? So the zygote now develops into a sporophyte. And that's the one that's epiphytic. That sporophyte is going to produce some spores, and those spores are going to be shed to develop into a sporophyte. And this sporophyte is going to be free living, which means it's not attached to another organism. It is not epiphytic, not attached to anything else. That sporophyte is going to have the sporangium. And that's where meiosis is going to go. So if you've got that concept, you've got the basic concept of the red algae, the complex red algae, it's like an extra sporophyte here. What we'll do at the beginning of the next time, we'll draw it again. And the next time we're going to draw it, we're going to put all the technical terms in and maybe a few drawings to show you what these things look like. Just remember, extra sporophyte attached to the female gametophyte. Okay, we're going to finish up the red algae today and maybe, but probably not, go on to the euglenophyta. So on the rhodophyta, we have this very complex life cycle. We've gone over a couple times. We're going to do it once more at least today. The new thing that we've got here is now we've got two sporophytes. one that's being produced from the zygote, and this one, this sporophyte one, remains attached to the gametophyte. So this one is attached to the female gametophyte. So it's small. It's a small sporophyte. It remains attached to the female for its life. Looks like a, in many cases, it looks like kind of a little fruit that's hanging on this gametophytic female plant. It's going to produce some spores, and that's going to grow into this second sporophyte, and that's kind of our normal sporophyte. That's the one that we would normally be calling the sporophyte in these organisms if there was only one. So this is extra sporophyte, sporophyte number one that is produced. That's the big difference, and that's the hard thing to get your head around at first, that there's these two sporophytic generations.
Another difference is that we have differentiated sexual organs. Now we've got a carpogonium and we've got a, I call it a spermatogonium. Um, it's really a spermatangium. I checked the notes today, so a spermatangium is the, really the correct term there. So a spermatangium and the spermatia come out of that. So differentiated male and female sex organs. And in fact, the female side is gonna have a very specific kind of shape, a strict specific structure that we're gonna go into here in just a second. That's different from what we've seen before. So it is gonna be a kind of an egg, but it's not, not like any egg that you've ever seen before, and it functions a little differently. So that's the basic overview. Let's now go and get some terms and look at the carpogonium. So of course there are gonna be terms for just about all of those things. I'll just start with black here because we're gonna use some other colors to differentiate the different parts of the life cycle. We know we've got meiosis below the line. We can call it fertilization now in this case, kind of syngamy. Inviving a sperm and an egg. Now, it turns out that the sperm is not mobile in this case. The spermatia, they're called, instead of sperm to indicate that they're not mobile. But I think spertilization is probably close enough here. Syngamy in that position is always correct. Fertilization is sometimes correct, and I think it's close enough here to call it fertilization. So fertilization or syngamy, either one in this case is okay. We get our zygote out of that. And then the zygote is gonna grow into our first sporophyte. But before we drive the sporophyte, let's put our haploid term above, our diploid below, and in order to help us understand the terms we're going to get for this first sporophyte that comes down here, the name of it is initially very counterintuitive, in order to help us understand those, we're going to start drawing our life cycle over here at meiosis. And we've got a new term over here, too, for these myospores. So you know that meiosis would normally produce myospores. And we could write that out there just to remind us, but I'm going to erase it in a minute. So when myospores are formed, they are normally formed from the process meiosis. And what do we know about meiosis? It starts with one cell, and it ends up with how many cells on the other side? four cells. So we start with a single cell, goes through two cell divisions, two nuclear divisions, and we end up with four cells. What's the Greek word for four? Well, I was hoping. Tetra. So like that gives us tetrahedron. So these spores that arise from meiosis in this case are called tetraspores. This is only in the red algae. And it will make a little more sense when we see the structure of our second sporophyte, the sporophyte that goes here, why they're called tetraspores. But it already makes a little bit of a sense, right? Because meiosis gives rise to four spores. And so you kind of say, well, why aren't they always called tetraspores? They're not, just in the red algae, tetraspores. We're gonna draw the female gametophyte above. And the male gametophyte below. And now I'm gonna switch colors to draw the sex organs just to emphasize them. We know that on the female side, the female sex organ is called the carpogonium. And here's what it looks like. It looks very different than normal eggs. 
So it's got a long extension and then it's got a fat bottom. And in fact, it's a single cell, but the nucleus, the egg nucleus, fits down here. And so we could call, in a way, that's that bottom part if we wanted to, the egg. But you just have to realize that it's all one cell, so it's a kind of a strange use of the term egg. But got the idea. And then this upper part is a hair. It's like a hair. We'll talk about how it functions in one second. So there's this long cellular extension that's kind of like a hair sitting out into the ocean. And so we call that the female hair in Greek. Hair in Greek is trike or trico. And female is gyne or gynus, so trichogyne. The trichogyne, the female hair. We're going to see that same term, those same kind of structures in other organisms later. So that's why we do it in some detail here. So there's the female side, the egg and the trichogyne in that carpogonium. On the male side, not quite as uh, complex there. Um, we have the spermatangium. which produces the spermatia. And the spermatia are non-flagellate. So there are just unicellular reproductive cells that do not have flagella. The spermatogonium, we'll see pictures of that in a minute. It, is just a mass of cells. Looks like a little club almost, or a little more pointy than that perhaps, but no sterile cells around the outside. And each of those cells in the spermatogonium, keep saying spermatogonium, spermat spermatangia, will be forming a spermatia. Okay, so why we have this strange structure, this trichogyne especially. So just think about the fact that those spermatia are unicellular and have no flagella. And they're going to be released into the ocean. The ocean is really big compared to the size of those unicellular cells, and they don't have any flagella. If they had flagella, on the female side, there could be sperm attractants, right? And they could, the female could release a little bit of attractant and the sperm could then swim toward that and the chance of fertilization would be increased. But there's no movement here on the male side. So any sperm attractants from the trichogyne or the egg are, are wasted. There are not So to increase the chance of fertilization, or perhaps I should say it increases the chance of fertilization, when there is a long hair extending from the female side. So that that hair then waves out into the ocean's currents and the spermatia then, just by chance, come up and can fuse with that hair. They can land on the hair and the cytoplasms can fuse and then the nuclei can fuse. So the idea that this trichogyne then is there to increase the chance of fertilization is an idea that we'll see again in other kinds of organisms. For us right now, we can just go and put in some arrows from the carpogonium. I've drawn it from the egg nucleus. Put that to fertilization, and that's taking place then to produce our zygote. Now, the zygote's going to do some interesting things that I'll talk about later. For now, let's go on and look at what comes out of the zygote. And remember that uh, the zygote is being produced on the female side, on the female gametophyte from the carpogonium. And we know it's going to produce a sporophyte. Carpogonium, I think we did the roots that of that last time, 
Gonium is a reproductive structure, and carpo is fruit. So, you know, gonium is a reproductive structure that has the connotation of like gonads in mammalian systems. So it's a, um, I'm losing my words. And I don't have my notes. It's in the sense of a seed, a carpogonium, a reproductive structure in the sense of being a seed. It's gonna produce something else is what I'm trying to say. Like the gonads are not the final product, they are producing the sex cells out of that. So the carpogonium is like that. It's gonna produce something else. In this case, the sporophyte. So the sporophyte that it produces is the carpo sporophyte. Oh, I'm trying to make this word more accessible, and I may not have succeeded in that. So the carpogonium produces the carposporophyte. And so what I'm trying to give you some way to remember are these weird words, carpogonium and carposporophyte. Fruit sporophyte. And we'll see when we look at pictures of the gametophytes with the carposporophytes on them, that the carposporophytes look kind of like little apples or little fruits that are on the gametophyte. And that's what the names are trying to refer to. So the carpogonium is the seed of those carposporophytes, the thing that's gonna produce the carposporophytes, and the carposporophytes are then the mature structure that are going to produce the spores. Well, if it's a carposporophyte, the spores have to be called Carpals. There can be carpal sporangia, we do the sporangia too, but the carpal spores, and they would produce carpal spores. So let's write carpal sporangia in there, which would be the boxes that the carpal spores are produced in. Those are all then diploid spores born on the gametophytic generation. We now have those carpal spores shed, and they are going to produce a sporophyte. That is going to produce tetraspores. The name of that sporophyte is naturally the tetrasporophyte. And the organ that is going to produce those tetraspores is the tetrasporangium. The tetrasporangium has a structure in which you can clearly see the four spores. So you'll see that in a minute. It makes kind of sense that we're calling it a tetrasporangium because in, in this case, we can clearly see that the four spores are being produced by meiosis. So that's our life cycle. That is the elaborated complex red life cycle. It is not true of all red algae. It is true of the most complex red algae. And we'll see one of those in lab, polycythonia. Um, it's the one that we'll look at the most in the lab. Okay, so as I said, we're not going over the reds as, in as much detail as we did the greens, but we do want to understand that in some cases there are these complex life cycles. And it's thought that the complex life cycles then evolve in a response to the fact that there are no flagella. These organisms lost their flagella at some point in evolutionary history long ago, and so this carposporophyte then is a mechanism of reproducing zygotes. So we've got a mechanism already now in for, uh, for fertilization to increase fertilization, the trichogyne. 
and the carposporophyte, this is, I'm going to say like asexual reproduction. for zygotes. So because fertilization is such a rare event, it is beneficial to these organisms if there is a way to take that rare zygote and make more copies of it. And that way is this extra sporophyte. And so in a way, we could think of that extra sporophyte even as asexual reproduction. And we could, if anyone ever did this, no, I've never seen a life cycle drawn this way, but we could, you can conceptually think of it as a life cycle with one sporophyte and this asexual reproduction coming off of the zygote to reproduce more and more zygotes. That's essentially what the carposporophyte does. Let's look at some of the organisms. And we'll come back to the complex one like polysiphonia, but we're going to look at some of the diversity and take, take a little break from our life cycles and then come back to them later. Here's the unicellular one we talked about, porphyridium. These, these cells here, these are all stained. This is not the natural color. The natural color is more like this. You can see a reddish, a reddish tint to these unicellular organisms. Not common to have unicellular reds, but this one is, and it is very, it's one of the ones that has been studied the most highly. So of course, if it's unicellular, the main way that it reproduces then would be by autospores. Just asexual reproduction by mitosis. Yeah, question? You can't... This? Yeah. You can't see that? Or pridium. I'll try to remember to move those. The genus here is not so important. What's important is the structure of the organism. These are branched filaments, and in fact, they're simple branched filaments. And by simple, we mean the kind of filaments that you've seen already. If we look at the structure here, we see that there is a single line of cells and that is called uniseria. Uni 1 seriate series. So, so far, you've only seen unicellular filamentous algae. So we haven't needed a term for it. We're about to see a change in that. So a branch filament composed of unicellular filaments, simple branch filaments. A typical kind of relatively simple red algae. Again, that stain. Now, now we have other cases of red algae where we have complex branch filaments. And you can see that these red algae look a little different. It looks like there's more structure there. Each of those branches looks like it's got some real substance to it there. And that's because they're not uniseriot in these cases. If we look in, under the microscope, and this is polysiphonia, this is the one we'll be looking at in lab mainly, and it's the one with that complex life cycle we've been drawing. And let's look at our filament here, though. That's what we want to see. We see that in this case, in this filament I'm drawing on, there are two series of cells running up. 
And if we look down here, we see that there are more than two, I don't know, maybe at least four, maybe five, now that I'm drawing them out. And so these are multi-serial filaments. complex branch filaments. There's other things shown on this slide, but that's what we want to look at right now. We have complex branch filaments or multi-serial filaments. And this is new in the red algae. Haven't seen that before in the greens. And you can also see the branching there. Here it is again, and this was a picture taken in the lab. It's kind of hard to get really good pictures of this, so if you have a chance in lab, try to get a good, better picture of polysiphonia for us. But you can see the multi-surrogate filaments. And now you can also see the Spermatangia. And you notice something that is not there. No sterile cells. So that characteristic of the algae is back. It's only that one group of algae, those azoosporic charophyce, that's the only group in the algae we're going to find the sex organ surrounded by sterile cells. And again, that's a reason why we think the charophyce, that azoic charophyce is closely related to the land plants. We also find those sterile cells in the land plants. Polysiphonia again. You can see here is the organism, a elaborated branch, a large branch of the organism. These ones, when they're, you saw those all, that last diagram we had where there were four different red algae laid out. And so phycologists take these things and they will lay them out on sheets of paper and dry them like this. And they make really beautiful specimens. These are herbarium specimens, which we talk about in my other class, plant systematics more. The other thing we can see here besides the multi-surrogate filaments is that we have an apical cell, and so in these algae there is apical growth. Polysiphonia. Now, of course, that does not occur in unicellular algae, et cetera, but in the more complex red algae. One more thing to see is here's the carpogonium. You see the trichogyne there? And you can see that the carpogonium is closely associated with some cells right next to it. In fact, the zygote nucleus, after it's formed, is going to migrate into these other cells. migrates into adjacent cells. And in fact, the carpo, um, carposporophyte is going to arise then from those adjacent cells. It doesn't form from the carpogonium itself, it comes from those cells. So remember that in these complex red algae, we have holes in the cell walls. So the nucleus can actually move through the cell wall. That happens in mammalian systems all the time, doesn't it? I've got another picture of that, I think, in just a minute. But I realize we're overdue for a break. Let's take a break. We'll come back and look at the tractospermum. And we can see those fruits in Batractospermum that give us our name. So here's Batractospermum, another organism that we'll be looking at today. And the main part of the organism that you're seeing in this life cycle, this is the gametophyte. <coughs> 
And then if you look closely, and it shows up a little better on your computers than here, that if there's these kind of balls on here that look kind of like apples or fruits, and these are the carpal sporophytes. I don't think we'll be able to see those in the living material we have in lab, but you can see them nicely, more nicely on the on your own computers than on this one. See them relatively nicely on the screen here. So the carpal sporophytes, and you see why that name might have been appropriate to someone who knows Greek. They look like little fruits hanging off of the gametophytes. Porphyra is a flat sheet of cells, so it's going to be a red flat sheet of cells instead of a green one here. Its structure looks a little bit different than all the two, but it's mainly um, just a, it's a member of the red algae adapting to the same kind of life zones that Alva does. So a flat sheet of cells. occurs here. Here it is, Portphyra, looking at, down at it. If you didn't make a, um, a slide of Ulva, or if you did make a slide of Ulva, you would have seen something very like this again. This is the edge of the flat sheet, and it's maybe two cells thick here in the center. Not a tremendous amount to see unless we were to look at the chloroplasts. The chloroplasts are really cool in Portphyra. They have, words fail me. I mean, what is that structure? Multi-arm, branched, nebular. Maybe that's a nebular chloroplast. I don't know. It's a really cool chloroplast, though. Very strong three-dimensional shape. That I hope you look at these things on your computer computers at home to it. They may look better to you out there than they do to me so close to it, but on my, if I look on my laptop here, it just is fantastic. You can see so clearly the structure of this chloroplast and the three-dimensional structure with the glasses on. So make sure you look at those um, on your computers at home. Okay, the red life cycle we've drawn in a number of times. I don't think we have exact, really enough time to do it all completely again. But we should at least remember that in the red life cycle, we have, I'm just going to call it syngamy at this time. We have the zygote, which produces the carpal sporophyte. which I'm just doing a very rough idea here, which produces the tetrasporophyte. Which through meiosis gives rise to the tetraspores. Which gives rise to our female and male gametophytes. which produces our carpogonium on the female side and on the male side, spermatangia. And the spermatia, which then unite in syngamy. So a very rough view of the life cycle of the red of the complex red algae with our extra sporophyte drawn in there. Back to looking at some of the structures of the organisms again, just to review them one more time. So again, here's the protractor spermum again. Remember that the red algae have um, carrageenan and agar in them, and so. You can see here the agar sheath around this filaments of Batractospermum. Here is the gametophyte, 
And over here too, most of this structure here, this is all gametophyte. And here is the carposporophyte. We'll look at a closer look at those carposporophytes in just a second. Polysiphonia, we've seen the multicellular filaments already. Again, here are the spermatangia. And again, you notice no sterile cells surrounding those spermatangia. So you should be able to see those in the prepared slides in lab very clearly. Polysiphonia, here are our carposporophytes of polysiphonia. Again, you'll be able to see these in lab. And here are, inside the carposporophytes, these are the carposporangia. So the carposporangia are going to open and release the carpospores, which are non-flagellated spores. Carpospores are released. And they go on then to form the tetraspores, the tetrasporangia, tetrasporophyte. They go on to form this tetrasporophyte. Here's another genus. We will not see this genus in lab. In this case, you see that there are some sterile cells. And this, these were there also in the carposporophyte of uh, polysiphonia, but they've been, uh, they're a little less coherent in this case. And so that lets us see in the carposporophyte the center part, which is where the carpal sporangia would be. So just see some variation then in the structure of the carpal sporophyte and the carpal sporangia in a different genus. Here is the tetrasporophyte. Tetrasporophyte of polysiphonia. Again, you can see here that we have a multiseriate filament. Lots of lines of cells here. And then there are certain cells which are larger. And these are the cells where meiosis is going to occur. These are the tetrasporangia. Look at those in a magnified view next. Again, multiseriate filaments. and tetrasporangia, and you can see them, the process meiosis is taking place from these younger tetrasporangia to the older ones. So in the older ones, there's actually going to be tetraspores present. So meiosis is taking place in the tetrasporangia. And each of these cells then is a tetrasporangia at some point of division. Down here, I think you can see there's little lines here between some of the tetraspores. So you're starting to see those cell divisions appear. And here it is in more detail. So this is a tetrasporangium. <clears throat> 
Here are the division lines for the tetrasporangia, between the tetraspores, rather, in the tetrasporangium. And our tetraspores are one, two, three. Where is the fourth tetraspore? Well, tetras, tetra also gives us our name tetrahedron, which is a pyramidal shape. And these tetraspores are arranged in a pyramidal shape in this case. So if you think of having three ping pong balls or racket balls or anything, you know, you'd have, and you're holding them in your hand, you could hold three on the bottom and you'd stick, lay one of those balls on the top of that to form a little pyramid of the balls. That's exactly what the structure is here of these tetraspores. The fourth tetraspore would be sitting on top or on bottom of this. That's the fourth tetraspore. And it's out of focus in this diagram, in this photograph, so we can't see it. But there would be four of them there in a tetrahedron shape. So this is a very classical way in which spores are oriented in myosporangia. They're oriented in these tetrahedron shapes. And when they do this, there are little scars here that are left on the spores that indicate they, well, they, first of all, they give the, scar, the, the spores a little bit of a tetrahedron shape themselves also. There's a rounded side to them, but the top side, the other side is a little bit triangular. And there are scars on them that indicate it came from meiosis. And we're going to come back to this when we talk in the land plants. We will see that we can identify these spores as having originated from meiosis because of these scars that appear on the spores. And you may even be able to see them in lab when we get to the land plants. So the tetrasporangium. One of the goals we want you to leave the class with is be able to interpret life cycles. And so by these lectures and by practice at home, we're hoping you're getting better at looking at these life cycles. And now we're going to take the life cycle of your book and try to figure out what all this stuff is about this life cycle and add a little more detail about this and talk just very briefly about asexual reproduction too. And I'm saying that so I remind myself I need to tell you a very little bit about asexual reproduction in the red algae. So our first task in the red algae and any life cycle is to find meiosis and syngamy on these life cycles. Not always that easy, but in this case they've got it labeled. Here's meiosis down here. Here's fertilization up here. And actually probably that's a right okay term in this case. So they got that all right. So meiosis would be below the line, that would be above the line. So there's our haploid diploid line that separates the two parts of the life cycle. It gets a lot easier once we know where that line is. So now we just got to figure which one's haploid and which one's diploid, where there's tetra stuff down here, but there's sporophyte. So this is diploid over here. This is haploid over here. That means we've got here, the tetraspores, and it even says tetraspores on the life cycle, if you could see that. And that's growing into our two gametophytes. Notice that those gametophytes look pretty much alike. And so our term for that is Well, we've got I've actually misled you on that. What I want to say is that there are two gametophytes, not one gametophyte. And that's what the term is we want. Heterophallic. When we compare them to see they are alike or not alike, we're going to be comparing the, I'll grab another color. We're going to be comparing the gametophyte with the tetrasporophyte. We haven't labeled the tetrasporophyte yet, but might as well do it now. So there's a tetrasporophyte down there. And you notice that the gametophyte and the tetrasporophyte look alike. And the term for that one is isomorphic. That's where isomorphic goes. And let's see if I can write it there. 
Okay, continuing around from the gametophytes, we have our spermatangia. and our spermatia. Here's the trichogyne. And the egg at the base of that. And you notice in this diagram, they very nicely indicated those cytoplasmic connections between the egg and its adjacent cells because you'll see that here we have the zygote nucleus and it has migrated out of the carpogonium into the adjacent cells. So here is then that zygote nucleus, I guess we could call it the zygote itself, which is going to grow into the carpal sporophyte. But it is not the carpogonium, actually, that grows into that. It is another cell. Inside our carposporophyte, we find our carposporangia. which produce then the carpal spores. And that's going to give rise to, the carpal spores are released, and give rise to our tetrasporophyte. Which looks just like the gametophytes and so is isomorphic. Within the tetrasporophyte, we find our tetrasporangia. And that's where meiosis occurs. So we've gone around the whole life cycle. So you can see by having those kind of schematic views in your mind, you can interpret these really complex diagrams of the life cycles that you find in textbooks like that. And that's what we'd like you to be able to do by the time you leave this class and by the time you take the midterm even. How about asexual reproduction? So there's no zoospores. There's no flagella, no zoospores. So zoospores aren't a possibility here. Filamentous ones, again, there can be fragmentation. It varies by the genus how effective that is, but for us, we'll just consider fragmentation. It's always a possible possibility in these filamentous algae. Even in the multi-seriate filamentous algae, fragmentation is a, po is a possibility. We should list that as kind of. Now, there can be an, a kind of spore that is produced that is like a zoospore, but it's not a zoospore because there's no flagella. And so you know what that means. There's a term for that. There's a new term for that. Because we are going to talk now about asexual, asexual reproduction through unicellular non-flagellated spores. And those are called, in the red algae, monospores. Mono meaning one. So the idea is that the cytoplasm of a single cell rounds up and is released similar to what you might find when a zoospore is produced. In some cases, there are just one zoospore for each cell, but now no flagellic, so they can't be, can't be zoospores. So we have just one minute or two minutes left before we end, and we're done with the red algae now. Let me just say a word about why we have all of this terminology that's different in each group of plants. And I, I, I say these things not because I've read a book and know the answer to this, but because I know I'm now in my 60s and I know people reasonably well, and I know scientists reasonably well, and so my explanation is based on life experience more than anything else. So why, why do we have all this weird terminology? 
Well, we've got people who from in their late 20s started specializing. And they specialized perhaps in the red algae. And they became a specialist and worked for their whole lives in the red algae. Now, you start to see things in the red algae then, like these spores that are come out here, they're not dull spores. And you say, well, you know, we want some way of recognizing both the fact that this is a different structure and also the fact that I am really special. I've worked my whole life in this thing. You can laugh at this now, but that's because you're not 60. <laughs> so it is partially because people specialize. And it's, I'm just I'm making fun of scientists now, but I make fun of everyone, so it doesn't really matter. nothing special about scientists in that. But it's also because people form communities and they want to be able to talk among those communities. And it gives the community a little more status if they can have their own terminology for that. I mean, look at any non-scientific community, right? Even among your friends, you develop your own language. And you know that you're friends because you got this own language of yourself, and these are the only people you talk to that way. Scientists are no different than that. They've got their own language for these languages. But they are based, to some extent, in real differences in the organism. Not completely social, but there is a social component to it. So I'm just saying that there's this, inter there's this I'm leading into this to say that there is this whole in really interesting scientific, social scientific discipline called the sociology of knowledge. And we don't even have a class in it here, but you wouldn't even know it exists if I didn't take these two minutes here. So just go out and Google sociology of knowledge and look at some of the cool things that people do about this. And they think about questions like this. Why does everyone have a different terminology in the album? Although they haven't addressed that specific one. But they talk about how communities of people influence how we think about knowledge. Really neat kinds of research. We'll see you in lab, and we'll go on next week to the Euglena Fighter.